Thank you for joining us today. I'm Kunle Akitola at Kingdom Secret Rema. Today we'll be looking at the life of Apostle Paul and we'll be doing a deep dive. We'll be talking about his early life. Uh, I will be analyzing the first missionary journey, the second missionary journey, and the third missionary journey. And we'll talk about the later end of Apostle Paul and Emperor Nero when uh, Apostle Paul was in prison. Uh, this man of God had a phenomenal ministry. And I believe that if we take time to study the life of this great man of God, there are a lot we are able to learn from the exploit of Apostle Paul. We'll be looking at uh, his treacherous journey to Rome and I will be studying the later part of his life and his encounter with uh, Emperor Nero. And we'll also be looking at the books he wrote and the letters he sent to the churches and the point, the time and the circumstances that were surrounding when he wrote those letters. When studying the Bible, especially when doing a character study, of the Bible. It's, uh, it's good for us to have an understanding of what was happening at that point in time, at that point in history. For example, Apostle Paul used sporting expression and athletic expression in some of his letters. Scholars believe that uh, Apostle Paul must have witnessed the Olympic Games as at that time. Of course, then it was called Ismian Games, which was held uh, around about 6th century BC uh, in then Greece. Some of the scriptures, uh, we have some of the scriptures and letters of Apostle Paul that contain this uh, athletic expression. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 24 to 27, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 24 to 27, it says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run but only one gets the prize run in such a way as to get the prize verse 25 everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training they do it to get a crown that will not last but we do it to get a crown that will last forever therefore I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the hair. Verse 27. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the price. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. We will, if you look at um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, he said, If anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rule. If anyone competes, in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Those are some of the scriptures, uh, and there are many more that portray and suggest to us that Apostle Paul, of course, I think uh, around the second missionary journey, he went to Corinth, you know, and uh, he must have witnessed some of this games and activities that took place as at then the Ismian games that happened uh, uh that happened during the during the during the spring uh at uh, that happened during the spring in Greece then so when we study the bible it is good for us to go deep in history and understand the context of what was happening around that time the political situation, the economic situation, you know, the socio-cultural ex experiences of the people as at that time. This gives us an immense understanding and immerses us into the scriptures for us to appreciate and gain more wisdom. And you know, the Holy Spirit can help us, uh, the Holy Spirit can also help us to have better understanding 
of what is happening at that time. So let's look at the early life of Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul was born in Tessos, today now Mediterranean Turkey. And Tessos is uh, around 961 miles uh, in the north of Jerusalem. Apostle Paul was born into a family of the Benjamites, uh, the, the same Benjamin of uh, King Saul, King Saul that failed God. Looking at the fact that they both bear the same name, Saul, Saul, it suggests to me that the story of the failed King Saul must have really touched Apostle Paul's heart. The Bible stated that Apostle Paul was being zealous for his father's religion. And everything he did, the persecuting of the church, was all out of zeal. Paul doesn't want to fail God the way his ancestors did. That's the failed King Saul. And it suggests to me that the experiences and the story of the failed King Saul must have had great impression on Apostle Paul. Anything Greek will have displeased Saul household. He could speak Greek and reasonable Latin. His household have probably spoken Aramaic, a derivative of uh, Hebrew, which was the official language of Judah. Saul and his family were Roman citizens, but viewed Jerusalem as a truly saint, but viewed Jerusalem as a truly sacred and a holy city. Many people have asked questions. Uh, how did Saul become a Roman citizen? Of course, the Bible stated that he became a citizen by birth. He became a citizen by birth. Now, his parents were both Jewish. So it suggests so to us that how did his parents become citizen? It's believed then by historian that if you own, if you earn a piece of land in their home you could become a citizen. So we might look at it that his parents uh, gain citizenship then by owning a piece of land in their home. The parents of Apostle Paul were elites in the society and it's good for us to take note of that, that the parents of Apostle Paul were elites and they were among the ruling class of those days. Saul. At the age of 13 years old, the father of Saul took Saul to learn under the feet of Gamaliel. And Gamaliel taught Apostle Paul the way of the law. Let's take a deep dive into the life of Gamaliel and who was Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a first century Jewish rabbi and a leader in the Jewish Sanhedrin. Gamaliel is mentioned a couple of times in the scripture as a famous and well respected teacher. Indirectly, Gamaliel had a profound effect on the early church. Let's talk about the Sanhedrin. You see, the Sanhedrin is a council of committee and judges at, as that, at that time. The Sanhedrin comprises of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These were the people, they were the religious leaders, the political and religious leaders at that time that understood the law and the seat, uh, the seat over Israel to apply the law and the, the teachings of Moses to the daily lives of the people as at that time, Gamaliel was a part of that council. It's also believed by some scholars that Saul at a point was also part of that council because we will still get to that to learn later the journey of Apostle Paul, of Saul when he was on his way to Damascus, when he had an encounter with Jesus. It was the decision of the San Indre was what Saul wanted to go and implement on his way to Damascus. Let's continue with, um, with Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a Pharisee and a grandson of a famous rabbi, Helia. Like his grandfather, Gamaliel was known for taking a rather lenient view of the Old Testament in contrast to his contemporary, Rabbi Shammai. Uh, you could take a uh, more in-depth study on Rabbi Shammai. Uh, Rabbi Shammai, who hold more stringent understanding of the Jewish tradition. In the case of Ga Gamaliel, Gamaliel, you know, 
had a more lenient view of the Old Testament. And uh, history and scholars state that elites of those days resonated more with Gamaliel because Gamaliel taught the people, taught the elites, the prominent people of those days, how they can profit from the laws of Moses, how they can build prosperity and have a better life from the law of Moses, and which could be one of the reasons why the father of Apostle Paul was have taken him to learn under the feet of Gamaliel. The first biblical reference to Gamaliel, to the first biblical reference of Rabbi Gamaliel is found in Acts chapter 5. This scene is a meeting of the Sanhedrin where John and Peter were standing in trial. After having warned the apostle to cease preaching the name of Jesus, the Jewish council became infuriated when Samuel Peter defiantly replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. Acts chapter 5 verse 29 Peter had no intention of ceasing to proclaim the gospel regardless of the possible repercussion. Peter's defiancy enrages the council who begin to seek the death of the apostle into the fairy steps the rabbi who was honored by all the people you get that in acts chapter 5 verse 37 first ordered the apostle to be removed from the room gamale then encouraged the council to be cautious in dealing with jesus followers in the present case i advise you leave this man alone let them go for if their purpose of activity is of human origin it will fail but if it is of god you will not be able to stand this man you will only find yourself fighting against god acts chapter 5 from verse 37 to 39 now what acts chapter 5 from verse 38 to 39 uh, much emphasis have not been given into the impact of gamaliel on the life of Apostle Paul. No wonder when Apostle Paul had that encounter on his way to Damascus, when he saw the light, he called it Lord. You see, the, the warning that Gamaliel gave the Sir Indra must have had a lasting impact on Saul, you know, letting the community know that let's take caution against the Christian followers. If what they are doing is of man, it will fail. But if this movement is of God, it will stand, and we can do nothing about it. The Sahindrin is persuaded by Gamaliel's words, and the council adhere to his advice, speaking to the influence that Gamaliel possessed. Later, Rabbi lauded Gamaliel for his knowledge. Gamaliel was also mentioned by the historian Josephus who wrote of the nobility of Gamaliel's son, Simeon. The Talmud also mentions Gamaliel, but there is still much that we do not know about him. The Talmud also mentions Gamaliel, but there is still much that we do not know about him. As with many figures from ancient history, our knowledge of Gamaliel is limited. And this gives us an understanding of life of Gamaliel. And, uh, and the type of teacher he was and the impact he has had on the life of Saul. Another remarkable story in the life of Saul was the murder of Stephen. Uh, it is stated that those that stoned Stephen dropped their clothes on the feet of Saul. The, that Saul supervised the stoning of Stephen. Uh, historians stated that Saul did not only supervise the stoning of Stephen, that Saul played an active role in the death of Stephen. Of course, Stephen was invited before the elders to come and defend himself uh, on the accusation laid against him. And Stephen did not leave on his stone on turn. He took the opportunity to preach to them and share the gospel of Jesus to them, which, of course, enrages the the crowd and it was being stoned to death so if you could remember i talked about the sir Andrew, 
So Saul was sent on a mission to Damascus. And on his way to Damascus, he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. You see, what Saul wanted to do as at that time was Saul was actually prevailing and was head bent on ending Christianity at that time. They were, they were not called Christians at that time, they were called the Nazarites. The Nazarites, those that believed uh, in the movement of Jesus. And he received a document. And he was to take the document to Damascus. On his way to the, at Damascus, he was given the right to arrest and bring everyone in Damascus who was a believer of Christ and bring them to Jerusalem to be persecuted. That was what he was going to do in Damascus. And as at that time, historians stated that Saul was at a strong reputation was already growing among the sign injury and he was known for someone who was vehemently against Christianity and defending the law which was the teachings of Moses. So he was at bent on going to Damascus to see the end of Christianity when he had a remarkable encounter with Jesus that changed history. Around 35 AD to 37 AD, Saul had embarked on this journey to Damascus, uh, which is also believed to be four to seven years after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And on his way to Damascus, he had an encounter with Jesus that changed the course of history. Let's look at um, let's look at Act chapter nine. Uh, Acts chapter 9 from verses 1 that contains the account of his remarkable and dramatic encounter with Jesus. Acts chapter 9 verse 1 Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogue of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, whether man or woman, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Who are of the way means who are of Christ, who are of the Nazarenes, as they call them, or who practice uh, Christianity. Verse 2, And he journeyed and came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, and he fell to the ground. And had a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the guards. So he, trembling and astonished, asked, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do do. Emphasis on the word must do. And that he was the dramatic uh, encounter and, and uh, repentance of Saul. While, while he was taken to Damascus, he was taken to the house of Ananias, who ministered to Saul and prayed for Saul. Uh, he, fast, he stayed in his house for three days uh, fasting. And when Ananias ministered to him, the Bible said a scale fell from his high. A fear fell from his high. Uh, let's look at the scripture. Uh, let me show you something. And uh, let's go to verse 7. Acts chapter 9, verse 7. And the man who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Verse 8. Then Saul arose from the ground. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. Now, you need to pay attention to that. That when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But he was led by hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. Now, there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, 
Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street, cross street, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying, and in a vision he saw a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he may receive his sight. And I answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to the saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and lay his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your road as you came had sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened, and saw sent some, and saw spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Something like skill fell from his high. My prayer for you and my prayer for myself is that whatever skill is blocking our high from the word of God, from the reality of God, whatever skill is blocking our eyes from seeing the direction and the will of God from our life, may it fall off from our eyes in Jesus' name. Let's continue looking at the life of uh, Apostle Paul. After that uh, encounter with Ananias, the Bible said he journeyed to Arabia and spent three years there. There was no much record of the life of Apostle Paul at Arabia. Uh, Acts, you can check Acts chapter 19, verse 17. Acts chapter 19, verse 17 on uh, his journey to Arabia. But uh, we scholars believed that uh, when he went to Arabia, he took a time for a retreat and to reflect on the new revelation he has found. And you know, at, at, at a point like this, everything will begin to make sense, you know, for Apostle Paul. Don't forget Gamaliel. The th the, what Gamaliel said when uh, they were about to kill uh, Peter and the Apostle, he, he, he told them, that if this movement is from God, it is time, and you guys won't be able to do nothing about it. So all this reflection, all these teachings, are what will be coming on to Paul's mind, and with the encounter that he had, you know, you know, and no wonder the man was so persuaded about the gospel. He understand the submission uh, to the Gentiles. He was so persuaded about the gospel that even the apostles. The apostles themselves who had been with Jesus, uh, who have seen Jesus, you know, had to give him a right hand of fellowship. So after Saul came back from Arabia to Damascus, uh, he faced some persecution in Damascus. He decided to go back to Jerusalem and this time around to subject his revelation at the feet of the apostles. Uh, if you check the scriptures, um, if you check Galatians chapter 1 from verse 17 to 8, Galatians chapter 1 from verse 17 to 8 said, verse 17 said, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them, which were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia. I returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him. For 15 days. Uh, that's Galatians. If you check Galatians chapter 2 now, verse 9. Galatians chapter 2, verse 9. He said, James, Cephas, and John, these seems as pillars 
gave me and Barnabas a right hand of fellowship. When they recognized the grace given to me, they agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Another remarkable event are in the story of Apostle Paul was the dream that Apostle Peter had. Apostle Peter had a dream where God told him that he should not call what he called clean unclean. Um, if you remember uh, the, the encounter of uh, Apostle Peter and um, Colinius, the Lord told him that he should not call what he calls clean unclean. Uh, these are the dreams um, that shaped the mind of Apostle Peter concerning the teachings and the revelation of Apostle Paul. At 41 AD, Apostle Peter sent Barnabas to Antioch to enlighten the church of Antioch. He sent the Barnabas to Antioch to enlighten the church of Antioch. On the way, Barnabas also went to Tarsus to bring Apostle Paul to Antioch. Uh, after a year, they both conceived a plan to travel around the world and share the message of the gospel. Uh, Historians believe that the church of Antioch was planted by Apostle Peter. And no wonder uh, Barnabas went to fetch Pete, uh, Apostle, Paul, uh, Apostle Paul. He, he, he was still bearing soul at that time and fetch him and take him to Antioch. Uh, because you see, Antioch were Gentiles. There were a lot of Gentiles at Antioch. And they needed to fetch Apostle Paul because the message in Jerusalem had been shared that Saul had been saved and Saul carried the message for the Gentiles. So Barnabas went to Tarsus and fetched Saul and took him to Antioch for them to share the message at Antioch. Ah, you see, it, the message has spread around Jerusalem about the conversion of Saul and the ministry that Saul had received, that Saul had positioned himself as a messenger to the Gentiles. So that made sense for Barnabas, who was being sent by Apostle Peter to go to Antioch and and that made sense for him to beckon on Paul to follow him to Antioch. At Antioch, they had a very, very remarkable experience and they had results at Antioch. No wonder they both conceived the plan that let's go around the world. And that was the bet of the missionary journey. So Paul, so Saul and Barnabas went alongside to embark on the first missionary journey and they went alongside with one John Mark. Pay attention to John Mark because we we'll still talk about John Mark, how John Mark caused the separation of Paul and Barnabas. To have a good grip about uh, the understanding of the first missionary journey, uh, the journey uh, uh, of between Saul and Barnabas. Uh, we need to look at Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14. Uh, Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14 document um, a summary of the experiences during this journey. Acts chapter 13 verse 1. Now in the church of Antioch, there was a prophet. There were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, Cornelia, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work of which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed hands on them, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Two of them went on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. 
When they arrived at Salmis, they proclaimed the word of God to the Jews, synagogue, John with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Papos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named by Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sagius Paulsius, the proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Helmas, the sorcerer, for what for that is what his name means that by Jesus opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled the Holy Spirit, looked straight at the elements and said, You are a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceits and trickery. Will you never will you never stop perverting the right away from the law? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. And immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed and was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So all this uh, in Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14 uh, were documentation of the first missionary journey of uh, Apostle Paul. Now, something remarkable happened in this first missionary journey, which uh, we need to take note. In this first missionary journey was when Saul changed his name to Paul. Uh, we are going to talk about that uh, uh, shortly. But let's look at the cities they cover. From Antioch, where they lived, they came to Cilicia, as we've seen in Acts chapter 13. They came to Cyprus. It was at Cyprus that Paul changed his name from Saul to Paul. And the reason why he changed his name was because he adopted a name that people, the Gentiles, because his ministry is sent to the Gentiles, he adopted a name that the Gentiles could resonate with. Saul is a Jewish name. So he changes to Paul so that the Jewish, the, the Gentiles could resonate with that name more. And um, let's talk about the name change because you see, there, there have been some controversies about the change of name. Many people believe that um, Saul changed his name to Paul at the point of conversion. In fact, people believe that when the light shined on him on his way to Damascus, that the Lord instructed him to change his name. So they will say things like, you know, when Paul got converted and changed his name to Paul, when Saul got converted and changed his name to Paul, that's what people say. But that, that's not what the Bible documents. You and I, you, you, we've studied, uh, we've studied the journey when he got converted on his way to Damascus. There was nothing like that. He changed his name to Paul at his first missionary journey when he got to Cyprus because he needed to pick a name uh, that, uh, that people could more connect with. Now, let, let, let's take a deep dive into, uh, into the name change. You see, in Acts chapter 9, verse 4, when he had that encounter, Jesus addressed him as Saul, Saul, not as Paul, Paul. Jesus addressed him as Saul, Saul during, during, this, uh, during his Christophany, when he got changed to Christian. You see, nothing in the narrative suggests uh, that his name was changed to Paul. Uh, Ananias addressed him as Saul after the conversion in Acts chapter 9, verse 17. Ananias addressed him as Saul. There is no mention of a name change. The Holy Spirit called him Saul after his first missionary trip. In Acts chapter 13, verse 12 says, While they were worshipping the Lord, the Holy Spirit still called him Saul before his first missionary trip. Before his first missionary trip, the Holy Spirit still called him Saul 
get that in Acts chapter 13 verse 2. Remember I told you that documentation for of his first missionary journey we find it in Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14. So in Acts chapter 13, you know, verse 2, while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And that is after he had been converted and he is a Christian. So his name was C. Saul. So this is to establish the fact that it was not Jesus that changed his name to Paul. As many people do say that when he got converted, God changed his name. It was not Jesus that, it's not God that changed his name. In fact, in Acts chapter 13 verse 9, Acts chapter 13 verse 9, but Saul, who was also called Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 13 verse 9, Saul, who was also called Paul, in fact, he kept both names. It was not a name change. He, he was referred to as Paul. He was also referred to as Saul. In Jerusalem, they referred to him as Saul. Uh, the Gentiles referred to him as Paul. Same person. It was not a name change. Are we getting it now? now it, it, it's vital and crucial that we study the word of God for us to gain understanding of what actually happened. And what actually happened because it gives us uh, it gives us to understand the operations of God. The word of God says that we err, that you err because you don't have the right understanding of the scripture and because you don't have the understanding of the power of God. So I'm going to give uh, a narration of how the journey went at uh, uh, with their first uh, missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas and John Mark walked to, walked to Seleucia on the coast and sailed to Salmos on the island of Cyprus. Don't forget, I said that Cyprus, that's where he changed his name. To, that's where he added his name, another name to Paul. And Cyprus, that's where he had his, the name Paul. Cyprus, where Barnabas came from. They preached in the synagogue and traveled the whole land, apparently without seeing much fruit, until they arrived at a city called Pahos in the southwest, the island's Roman proconsul. The Roman proconsul we talked about earlier on at Acts chapter 13. Roman proconsul Sergius Paulus some summoned the missionaries to listen to their message unfortunately the proconsul associate by jesus by jesus remember we talk about that jesus aka elemos was a magician and a jew false prophet who contradicted the gospel message and tried to keep sergius palos from converting empowered by the holy spirit paul made by Jesus go blind and Sergius Pilos believed in Christ. You can find that account uh, in Acts chapter 13 from verse 4 to verse 12. Paul, Barnabas and John Mark sailed from Paos to Pagia in the region of Pamphylia in South Central Asia, Asia Minor. Now you see Pamphylia, when they got to Pamphylia, John Mark left them and went back to um, went back to Jerusalem. And we, we realized it that when they were preparing for the second missionary journey, there was a dispute. This became a dispute between Paul and Barnabas. Uh, why John Mark des deserted them and Pamphylia? Some scholars believe that they were imprisoned and persecuted at Pamphylia. And John Mark, uh, this persecution with them, left them and came back. When we get to the second missionary journey, you see where Paul saw John Mark as a body and decided that he would not, he would not allow, he would not allow him to go with him uh, for the second missionary journey. So at Pamphylia, let me note that John Mark left them and came back to, um, came back to Jerusalem. It doesn't seem Paul and Barnabas spent much time at Pagia but added not to Pisidian Antioch. Not to the Antioch they left. This is under Antioch. It's called Pisidian Antioch. 
and preached in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. In his sermon, Paul, a credential Pharisee, gave a synopsis of the Israelite exiles in Egypt and George and King Saul and David, John the Baptist. He showed the Jews in Antioch how only Jesus who died and rose again fulfilled the Jewish prophecy. Many believe. And they asked Paul and Barnabas to return in the next Sabbath. The next week, almost the entire city showed up. Now, this happened after they thought that their journey was, was not fruitful. Almost the whole city showed up. But the Jewish leaders were jealous of the crowd and tried to silence the message and the, with abusive language. Paul and Barnabas pointed out that the Jews had their chance and had rejected Jesus. So Jesus' message was going to be brought to the Gentiles. The gospel spread through the, gospel spread through the whole region. But eventually, despite the new converts and to enthusiasm, the Jews in Pisidian, in Pisidian Antioch cheered up persecution of the missionary. Paul and Silas traveled east to Iconium in Galicia. Paul and Barnabas stayed quite a while in the city of Iconium, preaching boldly and performing miracles. Many Jews and Greeks believed, but many didn't. The missionaries caught word that the unbelieving Jews, Gentile, and city leadership were planning to stone them. So they fled the nearby city of Elystra and Debi in Lycia. While Paul was preaching in the gate of Elystra, he noticed a lame man listening intently. He healed the man. Now, this document, what I'm saying, what, what I'm reading now, you can find it in the book of Acts chapter 14. He healed the man. And the crowd declared that Barnabas must be Zeus and Paul Hamas. As Amos, as the messenger and the two spokesman of the gods, the priest of the temple of Zeus joined the crowd and attempted to offer sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas. Sacrifices that were barely prevented by Paul and Barnabas instead, but they were just men. As a counterpoint, the unbelieving Jews from Antioch and Iconium arrived at Lystra and steered up the crowd against the gospel. The resulting mob stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city. When the disciples gathered around his lifeless body, Paul stood up completely well and went back to the city hallelujah you get that in acts chapter 14 from verse 8 to verse 20. the next day paul and barnabas went east to Derby, situated across the mountain range from tassos and made many disciples it was in the region of Lystra and Derby that young timothy had the gospel from paul and was saved. From Debe, Paul and Barnabas backtracked through Asia Minor, visiting Lystra, Iconium, Persidesia, Antioch, and strengthened the young church and the appointing leaders. You can get that in Acts chapter 14, verse 21 to 23. Paul and Barnabas returned to the sea port city of Paga to preach. And then they hopped over at Atelia, a few miles west, and preached there. You can get that in Acts chapter 40 from verse 24 to 26. And they sailed back to Syria, Antioch. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how they had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. You can find that in Acts chapter 14, verse 27. This summarizes uh, the journey 
the first missionary journey uh, embarked on by Paul and uh, Barnabas. And they had a very remarkable experience. A great thing happened in this journey. The conversion of Timothy at Dede uh, was very remarkable because Timothy uh, will eventually become uh, uh, a, an important figure and a servant of God uh, in this journey. Now, something remarkable happened while they were away uh, in this first missionary journey. By the time they came back, uh, don't forget, you know, when they arrived, they gathered the church together to report what the Lord has done and how they had an open door. Something remarkable happened. They realized that some brethren had come from Jerusalem to come and share the message with the church that they've left at Antioch. And that did not sit well with Apostle Paul. In fact, uh, it caused a disagreement. And Paul and Manama, they threw their disagreement to Jerusalem. You know, this brethren came and told the people that uh, for you to be a Christian, you need to be circumcised. And in the teaching of Apostle Paul, he doesn't believe that, that you need to be circumcised for you to be a Christian. The next day, Paul's nephew, Apostle Paul's nephew, overheard that a group of 40 men had vowed to keep Paul and die trying. He passed that intel to Paul, then to the Centurion Tribune. You can get that in Acts chapter 23 from verse 12 to verse 22. That night, the commander sent Paul to Felix, the governor of Caesarea, with an escort of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. The commander wrote a letter explaining the situation and requesting that Felix took over the investigation against Paul. The soldiers and the spearmen returned to the commander when Paul was safely away and the horsemen returned to Caesarea with Paul. Governor Felix promised to hear his case when the accusers arrived. You can get that in Acts chapter 23 from verse 23 to verse 35. After five days, Ananias the high priest and some Jewish elders had hired a lawyer and reached Felix's palace. The plea to Felix's ego and fear by insisting that Paul causes severe civil disturbance, disrupting the peace Felix had provided. Now, you need to understand what was happening as at them. It's not as if the elders of Jerusalem uh, were in good terms with Felix, but you see, they, they were working on Felix's psyche, uh, trying to gain uh, uh, his favor so that he would be on their side. Uh, the Jewish leaders, as at then, uh, they were not happy in, with the Roman dominance as at that time. And in fact, that was when, and that was their belief that uh, one of the things the Messiah will do for them is to liberate them from the from the Jewish uh, from the Roman dominance. And it was one of the reasons why they couldn't believe that Jesus was the Savior because they believed that the Savior would come and liberate them from the dominion of uh, the Roman Empire. So that was also playing out here, you know, uh, for they, they cannot just persecute uh, Apostle Paul, you know, the Roman government was the power of the day. Apostle Paul confidently gave his defense, giving details of the last few days and explaining his only crime was believing in the resurrection of the dead, you know. Paul also pointed out that his original accusers from the temple were in presence and the Jewish elders had nothing to charge him with. Uh, you can get that in uh, verse 10 and to verse 21 of um, Acts chapter, uh, chapter 24. Felix understood Judaism and he also understood Christianity. He delayed, a he delayed uh, the decision until the Roman commander who had arrested Apostle Paul arrived. Felix kept Paul under guard, but allowed him a fair amount of freedom. Felix also spoke to Paul frequently in hope 
that Paul would offer him a bribe. You will find that in verse 26. Now, th this is something is playing out. You need to understand who Apostle Paul was. You know, for someone like Felix, who was a governor, to presume, uh, to assume that someone like Paul could have bribed him to get out of uh, the situation, that to tell you who the character of who Apostle Paul was. Apostle Paul was not... Um, Apostle Paul was not uh, a mediocrity in the society. He, this man have, has capacity in his days. This man has influence. All his days, while before he became Christian, while he was still, be, um, while he was, you know, pursuing the Jewish religion, this man had capacity. Those that were trained under Gamaliel in those days, as we said earlier, they were elite. His family were elite, you know, and um, and. Coupled with the fact that he was a Roman citizen, he was a top. Uh, he, he, Apostle Paul could be said of someone who is um, an elite in the society. But that is something we learn from uh, uh, from him. If he's learned to abase himself, he said it in the scripture. He's learned to abound and to abase himself. He's learned to work with his end, you know. Uh, and and he he is not. His position was not to show off um, his status uh, in the society and talk about it, you know, um, make it, uh, uh, paint it at everybody's face, you know. But his position has always been an humble position. So two years passed and there was no charges uh, against uh, Apostle Paul. And Felix was succeeded by, by Festus. And that's something you mean Apostle Paul was actually detained in Jerusalem for two years. You know, so when Festus came and succeeded Felix, Festus, you know, chaired the case. Festus, wishing to, to get favor from the Jewish leader, left Paul in the prison. So when Festus came in, because he wanted to get favor from the Jewish leader, he left Paul in the prison. So what was the political game that was played around them was that whoever is coming uh, to Israel as uh, as a governor sent from the Roman government, you wouldn't want your territory to be disrupted. You know, uh, your 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 king, your president sitting in Rome wouldn't want to hear that the Jewish leader and you are having disruption at Jerusalem. So whoever is in charge of that place will also want to play the game. Even though a person has capacity, even though the Jewish leader uh, seeks approval from uh, this, uh, from from whoever is the governor, but also in your in your capacity, you wouldn't want to have a society that uh, that is not at peace. When Festus, you know, succeeded Felix, he needed the favor of the of the Jewish leadership, and because of that. He kept Apostle Paul in prison. There's a lesson to draw from you. Many things we find the society today, uh, the the political games, uh, the economical biases, uh, and uh, many societal problems we find in governance today. Uh, we can trace them into the Bible. And from the word of God, we can gain lessons and understanding of the human mind and understand how the human being is and it is always the same human will always be human you know and we can gain understanding from god's word it also plays through in the life of jesus you know all the stages of of uh lego all the stages of lego drama that jesus christ went through had a political tone to it uh let's continue with uh the life of apostle paul you know a few days later King Agrippa and his wife, Bernice, came to visit Festus in Caesarea. Festus told them about Paul's case, and Agrippa desired to speak to, uh, to Paul. Festus was delighted. He was uh, legally obliged to send Paul to Caesar, but there was no charges. He hoped Agrippa could find something to justify Paul's imprisonment and transfer him to Rome so that he can get the case out of his hands. <laughs> you know, he wants to pass the monkey, you know. Paul was also delighted to speak as the new King Agrippa 
was uh, as he knew King Agrippa was knowledgeable about the Judaism. In his defense before Agrippa, Paul gave a long version of his testimony, including his conversion on the road to Damascus and his work among the Gentiles. Agrippa's legal option was that Paul was innocent. If Paul had not insisted on his right of being sent to Caesar, Festus would have obliged to release him. But Paul insists that he wants to be sent to Caesar in Rome. Don't forget that Paul had a revelation and God told him that he's going to have his desires of going to Rome to preach the gospel in Rome. Throughout these trials and challenges that besieged Paul, Paul wasn't looking at it from the side of freedom or what was happening to him. Paul was looking at it from the side of his assignment and his vision. Call what was playing through, Apostle Paul was not about his release. Apostle Paul was about the revelation he had that he's going to preach in Rome and he wants to get to Rome. So Apostle Paul was headed to Rome where he wanted to go. Although he did not plan to go as a prisoner, but you know, uh, at least he has the opportunity now. Justus, the centurion in charge of transporting the prisoner, treated Paul well. The first step was their voyage was from Sidon. Luke and Aristarchus, Luke and Aristarchus, a believer from Thessalonica, were allowed to accompany Paul, and Justus allowed other Paul's friends to visit him in Sidon and see to his needs. You can see that account in Acts chapter 27 from verse 1 to 3. Don't forget the scriptures that we've been looking at, you know. The details of Paul's, Apostle Paul's apostolic journey uh, is clearly outlined from Acts chapter 13. And if you go through the scripture from Acts chapter 13, we are now in Acts chapter 27. And don't forget, we uh, we are on the progress towards his fourth uh, missionary journey. They travel as far as Mera on the southern coast of Asia Minor before transferring to another ship vessel. The weather grew uncooperative and the ship made it to a fair haven on the southern coast of Crete with difficulty. Apostle Paul advised Justus to stay in the winter in fear ever. But the Centurion listened to the pilot of the ship and the uh, pilot of the ship and the ship owner instead of listening to Apostle Paul. And they continued west, hoping to reach the crate of Phoenix to winter there. And of course, you know what happened. They suffered great loss. They even lost the ship. They never made it to Phoenix. A fierce storm, you know, arise. And the storm drove the ship, of course, battering the ship for many days and causing the crew to give up their hope. You can get that in Acts chapter 27 from verse 13 to verse 20. One night, an angel appeared to Apostle Paul in the message and told him, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. God has graciously given you the life of all who sail with you. So, you know, Apostle Paul encouraged the people on board uh, with the prediction that their life will be saved, you know, because he had received a message and that the ship will be lost, but their life will be saved. You know, and true to Paul, you know, uh, and he t- that their life will be saved, and he told them because he received a revelation from uh, an angel. And uh, according to the words uh, of the angel and the revelation that given to Apostle Paul, the ship was wrecked, but everyone on board were made to safety on the shore of Malta. Why they were at Malta? Something remarkable happened because there was cold in Malta. So uh, the shipwrecked victims, you know, went to gather sticks and firewood and made fire while they were at Malta. And a deadly viper was eating that the sticks that they gathered for firewood. 
and one of those vipers fastened his hands on the hand of Apostle Paul. And the people of Malta thought he would die. In fact, they thought he would just fall and die. The Bible says he shook his hand and shook off the viper into the fire. You can find that account in Acts chapter 28 from verse 1 to verse 3. And when the people waited, thinking he will die, they thought, you know, that um, he, he, he must be a wicked person, God must be punishing him, must be a murderer for such um, crime to have happened to him. And when the people waited and see that he did not die, you know, they changed their opinion and they purpose in their heart that he must be God, you know, since he has suffered no harm. And that that teach us about the frailty of, of the human mind, you know. People they were thinking just uh, earlier on that Apostle Paul must be a murderer, must be a criminal, and they've changed their mind suddenly to say that he must be a god. The chief officer of the airline took care of Apostle Paul and his friends for three days. While in his home, Paul had the opportunity to heal the officer's father who was sick with fever and dysentery. Soon, the rest of the island brought their sick. Apostle Paul uh, was still a prisoner, you know, uh, and they stayed in Malta for three months before another ship came and took them to Rome. Once they arrived in Rome, uh, Apostle Paul was able to meet with believers from the, from from the areas in his private quarters. Uh, he also met with the Jewish leader and explained what had happened to him in Jerusalem. They agreed to hear his message and filled his lodging you know, while he spoke. Uh, some, 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 some believed his gospel and some didn't. Paul stayed in Rome uh, at his own expense waiting for his trial teaching and preaching the gospel for two years while he was waiting for his trial it's likely that he also you know while he was um, on this trial uh, on his on his way to rome where he was arrested his belief that at that point at at that uh, at that time was when he wrote um the book of colossians was when he wrote the book of ephesians was when he wrote the book of Philippians and the book of Philemon, you know, at this point in time while he was waiting for his trial. And of course, uh, Caesar could not find him guilty. So after his release, Apostle Paul went to Macedonia, Asia Minor, and continued his missionary journey. And that led us to the fourth missionary. After his release, he took a journey to Macedonia and Asia Minor, and it's believed that that's when he wrote First Timothy and the book of Titus. Paul took at least three journeys, you know, coming from Cyprus to Syria to Asia Minor and Greece before accused. Um, some scholars believe that he was imprisoned twice, you know, in, in Rome. Uh, and this was because of, uh, if you check Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 16, the uh, Apostle Paul wrote, uh, from prison, referring to his first trial, so people thought, believe that he was in prison twice. You know, uh, some of the places that he visited at this point, uh, believe he visited Crete, Corinth, Mentos, Macedonia. There is a tradition that Paul went to Spain, but there is no record of this in the Bible. He did mention to the Romans that he wanted to take the gospel to Spain. Uh, that you find that in Romans chapter 15 from verse 24 and verse 28. Uh, the, the Clement of Rome in 95 AD writes, say that Paul went to the farthest limit of the West, which could mean Spain or possibly the United Kingdom. The Muratonian Canon 180 AD believed that Apostle Paul actually went to Spain. It's believed that Paul's second arrest brought to his fourth missionary journey to an end. And he was sent to a uh, Mapterian prison, which was, which was much rougher than being kept in the house arrest which he was lodging. During the second imprisonment in Rome, Apostle Paul knew the time of his departure 
from this world was near no during second uh, imprisonment in rome uh, he was cared for by uh, luke by timothy by women furious uh, this women furious uh, apostle paul wrote to timothy that uh, he should mentor this women furious that uh, knowing that he was indebted to him uh, you can find that in the book of philemon you know so um, um uh, this was the later end of the life of apostle paul before he was being arrested by uh emperor nero uh you know as at uh, around uh, 62 ad uh, nero became the king of, of rome and he really persecuted the church around then uh, nero uh, was fiercely against Christianity and you know he sorted after Paul knowing that Paul was a, was a kingpin of the move of, of the prosperity of Christianity and the movement of Christian at that time. So Emperor Nero came with a season of persecution to the church heavily and he arrested Apostle Paul. Uh, during his arrest by Emperor Nero uh, that's when he wrote uh, the book of 2 Timothy he said some remarkable things to Timothy. He said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 to verse 8, he said, For I am now ready to be offered. For I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me alone, but unto all them also that love is appearing. That was the part of the letter he sent to Timothy. And that shows us that even before he was being beheaded by Nero, Apostle Paul knew that his time is up. This is uh, in the, this is the study of this great apostle, this great man of God, that has changed history and has shifted history in a tremendous way. Thank God for the life of this man, Apostle Paul. Would not take the message of Christ and let it just sit there in Jerusalem, but take it all over the world. And the impact and the effect of his work is what we've seen all around the world that has spread Christianity all around the world. Since the time of Jesus Christ, there have been a conspiracy from the kingdom of hell to impede the spread of the message of Jesus. In fact, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ was being manipulated and submerged by the political elite and the media at that time. They brought a negative report to say that the disciples of Jesus Christ were the ones that stole his body and ran away. There had always been a propaganda to discredit the spread of the gospel. And even after Christ Jesus was even after jesus ascension the the message of christ wanted to to be contained only in jerusalem thank god thank god for the life of apostle paul whom god used whom the holy spirit inspired to take the gospel to the nations of the earth and today jesus is enthroned jesus is glorified by all nations by tongues, by whole tongues all around the world. Hallelujah.